Welcome friends, today we're gonna talk about the seven wonders of video game history. So what are the characteristics of the seven wonders as we know them? Well, they're all from the ancient past, so for video games that probably means somewhere around 30 years ago. They're also all monumental. The sheer size of the wonders is a huge part of their legacy. And there's a bit of mystery surrounding each of them in some form or another. So for video games, it wouldn't be just the top seven bestsellers or the top seven favorites. I think we need something a bit more curated than that. So the first and the most important one is Pong. Now, Pong is not the first video game, but it is derivative of what we refer to as the first video game, known as Tennis for Two or Computer Tennis. But Pong was actually the first commercially successful video game, and Pong's existence, as well as its success, are both a miracle. They had difficulty finding investment money for it, because at the time, banks saw Pong as a sort of pinball-looking game, and pinball at the time was generally associated with the Mafia. However, they did eventually find someone that would lend money to them, and the first assembly process for this was very slow. They were not able to keep up with the demand, only being able to make about 10 cabinets per day, and many of them actually failed their quality testing. But after all of the trial and tribulation, they did eventually iron out and streamline the assembly process, and Pong was erected as the first monument in video game history. Okay, so next up we got Pac-Man. Now there's a lot more to Pac-Man that we tend to forget about today. First, Pac-Man was originally called Puck-Man, from this phrase, Paku Paku Taberu, which means to gobble up. Now, Pac-Man was specifically designed to be appealing to women as well as men, whereas at the time, just about all video games were about things like sports or space battles, and it was also made to be very colorful to appear to younger players as well. We already know that Pac-Man was a massive success, but Pac-Man also has some very interesting and innovative designs. Now, all four of the ghosts actually each have their own separate AI, or personalities as it were, which would have been quite novel at the time. Blinky chases you from behind, Pinky and Inky both try to get in front of you, and Clyde switches between chasing Pac-Man and avoiding him altogether. Pac-Man was the first game to have any kind of deterministic AI, where the AI makes choices based on the player's actions, or actually reacts to the player in any kind of way. And the screen wraparound thing isn't original to Pac-Man, but most people associate it with Pac-Man, and even refer to this effect as the Pac-Man Edge. But Pac-Man did actually invent the maze chase genre, and it was also the first video game to use any kind of a power-up. And Pac-Man also popularized using food as items in video games. And it was also the first video game to feature a mascot character. And it was also the first game to have cutscenes, depending on whether you count this little stage-changing animation as a cutscene from Space Invaders Part 2, which came out a year earlier. But nobody remembers that one, so Pac-Man steals all the credit and Pac-Man also has its fair share of rumors. The biggest and earliest Pac-Man rumor is about these two items that would appear only on higher levels. Some would say that golden bars would begin appearing after a certain amount of keys were eaten, and would give 10,000 points each. And after that, you would find screwdrivers, which would give you 25,000 points each. And then they would also say that some machines had them, and others did not. Okay, so you probably saw this one coming, but The Legend of Zelda for NES is monumental in video game history for a good number of reasons. So Zelda was first released on the Famicom Disk System, but then it was later released on the NES with a battery-backed memory. And this was the very first video game to ever have a save battery built into it. And it also had a second quest with different dungeon and item placements that you could play after beating the game, or you could play it by naming your file Zelda. This might also be the first iteration of a new game plus. 
That term wasn't coined until much later with Chrono Trigger, but that's basically what it is. And Zelda is probably the most definitive adventure series of all time. I mean, people that don't even know about video games can recognize Zelda. It's just that big. And the Zelda games are so full of mystery, and such good rumors like Ben Drowned, or all of the secret places and items that don't actually exist. Zelda has this rich legacy, and certainly stands as a monument in video game history. Okay, so Tetris is of course number four on this list, because the name is derived from these Tetrominos, which are all comprised of four squares. But it's also an absolute behemoth, and is probably the biggest monument in all of video game history. It's either the most sold video game of all time, or it's only now just behind Grand Theft Auto V and Minecraft, depending on how you look at the data. And there's also this phenomenon named after it called the Tetris Effect, where if you maintain an activity for long enough, it will pattern your thoughts, mental images, and dreams. Like you ever play a game like that for a long time, and then look away and you can still see it. It happens to me when I play DDR for a long time. After about an hour or two of that, you'll start to see arrows moving up even though you're not playing it anymore. It's also a bit of a miracle that Tetris even exists at all. So first off, it was developed by this Soviet software engineer in 1985. He was a speech recognition researcher that was asked to test the capabilities of new hardware. And he was making games on his institute's Electronica 60 as a sort of hobby. His goal was to use computers to make people happy. He said, Games allow people to get to know each other better, and act as revealers of things you might not normally notice, such as their way of thinking. Tetris was inspired by these pentominos that he loved to play with as a child, and decided to scale it down and to use the smaller tetrominos and the name is derivative of Tetra, which means four, and his favorite sport, which is tennis. Now, computers were hard to come by in the Soviet Union at this time, because there was this whole embargo thing that had happened from World War II, and this Electronica 60 did not have a graphical interface, and this absolute legend used text characters to make up the graphics of the game. The story goes that after he finished his first version of Tetris, he was showing it around to all of his colleagues, and everyone very quickly became addicted to it. And then it was added to every institute in Moscow that had a computer. And then it very quickly got banned after people were caught not working to play Tetris. So then he wanted to export Tetris, but didn't know how. And his supervisors in the academy were a bit irritated with the success of the game, since they had not intended for such a creation to come from the research team. And then to make it worse, copyright law of the Soviet Union created a state monopoly on all import and export of copyrighted works. And the Soviet researchers were not allowed to sell their own creations. So he was happy enough to just let the Academy have all of the rights so long as he could get it out there for people to play. And then there was this whole thing about who could have the rights to publish it in the West. It all got very complicated, and the long and short of it was that there was this one guy who expressed interest, and the creator was communicating with him via fax, and the Soviets didn't know that fax could be considered a legal contract in the Western world. So this guy they were faxing thought that he had the rights, when the Soviets thought that they were just talking. And then that guy went on and signed contracts with two other companies to let them publish it, and then those companies were selling their rights to other people as well. After enough of this trickling down, there was a notable Nintendo versus Atari case over Tetris. They had both gotten some kind of rights to publish Tetris, but Atari only had rights to publish on computers, and Atari was trying to argue that the NES was a computer. It really is a good argument though, because Famicom is an abbreviation of Family Computer. However, Nintendo wins the case, and Atari wasn't allowed to publish their version of Tetris on console. And then many years later, that Soviet guy that created Tetris moved to America and partnered up with one of the guys that had half of the rights to Tetris. And then they together bought the rest of the rights that were out there and founded the Tetris Holding Company. 
and then the Tetris Company and Tetris lived happily ever after. Okay, so next we're going to talk about Doom. Now the first thing is that Doom is obviously derivative of Castle Wolfenstein 3D, which was actually made by the same people that made Doom. So you could say that both of these together are the fifth wonder of the video game world. Or you could also say that Wolfenstein had to walk so that Doom could run. Now the design of this game is absolutely genius. When these games were coming out, there wasn't much for action games on PC. All the PC games that were out at the time were like these strategy and role-playing type games. And all of the best action games were on console or on arcade. Now these games use some very creative tricks to make a game that's actually played on a single plane appear to be in a 3D space. Using calculations to draw sprites bigger or smaller based on the distance to the player, the entire game is actually just played on this horizontal axis. And because computers didn't have much for graphics capabilities at the time, they used this software rendering trick that would only draw and render the sprites that were in the player's direct line of sight. And anything that wasn't in view wasn't rendered so that it could be playable on as many computers as possible. And the method that it uses to achieve all this is all very complicated, and it is very impressive. It makes sure that absolutely no resource is ever wasted. And this hyper-efficiency is why you can run Doom on the most minimal specs possible. Like these old business machines that shouldn't even be able to play video games. Or even a calculator. It's unbelievable. Especially back then, it was truly magical. Doom and Castle Wolfenstein 3D are known as the godfathers of the first-person shooter. But there actually were some more primitive first-person games that came out before them. Mostly dungeon-crawling RPGs like Ultima Underworld. But there was this wireframe-looking first-person maze shooter game that was made by MIT students for NASA called Maze War. If you can even call this a game but it is still impressive for 1973. Doom popularized the first-person shooter, and its legacy continues with all these mods, and sequels, and mods for the sequels. I mean, people are taking the Doom engine and building all sorts of stuff with it. Like this first-person VR Zelda 1 game. Or this Sonic the Hedgehog game. Or this Mega Man game. So Doom is absolutely massive, and its legacy will live on as a monument in video game history. Okay, so Doom is the godfather of the first-person shooter, but Street Fighter 2 is the godfather of fighting games as we know them today. It's nowhere near the first fighting game though, there's a good handful of fighting games that had come out before it, like Heavyweight Champ, Karate Champ, or Yeah R Kung Fu. And some of these early fighting games, as they called them, were also really the first side-scrolling beat-em-up games. And the vision for Street Fighter was to make a 1v1 fighting game where the battles were like the strategic boss battles of those side-scroller games. So the first Street Fighter introduced this light, medium, and heavy attack idea. But it came with these pressure-sensitive buttons. One for punch, and one for kick. And how hard you hit the button is how you got which variation of the attack to come out. And the first Street Fighter also introduced special moves. And the clever workaround to get more moves in with only two buttons was to have the special move inputs be a combination of directions plus a button. And this is the origin of all of those goofy inputs for special moves in fighting games. The game became very popular, but people didn't care too much for the gimmicky controls, as it goes with most games. So they made a more standard controls version of the game, with a six-button layout. And this is where we get that from, too. Now, the six-button cabinet did a whole lot better, but Street Fighter was intended to have more playable characters. Only the clones, Ken and Ryu were playable, even though there were all these other guys in the game. 
It's just that they didn't have enough time to get it all programmed, so that they could be playable. And wanting to complete their vision, they right away got to making Street Fighter 2. Now, Street Fighter 2 was actually the first fighting game with any kind of a combo system, where skilled players could combine multiple attacks together that left the opponent with no time to recover if those attacks were timed correctly. The first Here You Know Ken game, Shanghai Kid, kind of has a combo thing, but it's not quite the same. There are certain points in the game where Rush will appear on the screen, and you can attack repeatedly if you can time your button presses correctly. It's called a rush attack, and it's really just pumping one attack over and over again, but only when the game decides that it's time for it. And the combo system in Street Fighter 2 is sort of a happy accident. But it was then made as an intended feature. And Street Fighter 2 also was the first fighting game with a dizzy mechanic. Blanca and Guile are also the first charge-style characters in a fighting game, where you have to hold a direction for a period of time to charge up a move before you can release it. Like hold back for a second or two, and then press forward and punch to do a special move. Zangief is also the first fighting character to have a command grab, and we've also got a healthy amount of rumors with Street Fighter as well. Like the legendary 10-0 matchup of Zangief vs Honda. Now, a 10-0 or 100-0 matchup is sort of a mythical thing in fighting games. They say that Zangief can reach Honda with a spinning pile driver at round start, and Zangief can keep getting you with that move over and over again if he lands one initially. So if he could catch you at round start and go infinite, that would definitely be a 10-0 matchup. But this, however, cannot be replicated on any existing versions of the game that we have today. But people remember it as a thing, and it's even listed in some matchup guides for Street Fighter 2. But maybe this was true in some early arcade version of the game. And then, Shen Long was an April Fool's hoax in Electronic Gaming Monthly to make people think that there was this secret character in the game that actually wasn't. And there were also all these other characters that were in the game already that you couldn't play as, so there were lots of rumors about how to unlock them. And then, as the other versions of Street Fighter 2 came out, there actually were secret characters that you could unlock by doing a combination of inputs at the select screen. Akuma was the first one that was introduced in Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and these actual secret characters made the rumors all that more believable. Street Fighter 2 really did lay the foundation of modern fighting games as we know them, and Street Fighter games are still massively popular today. Okay, so the last but not least wonder of video game history is Pokémon. And I'm really talking about the first generation of Pokémon games. Pokémon has become this titan in the video game space, and it's all because of these games. First off, Pokémon really pushed the technical limitations of the Game Boy. Everything from the music, to the size of the world, I mean, they really maxed it out. There were all of these Pokémon that didn't make it into the finished game because they ran out of space. And as for what's actually in the game, there's 151 Pokémon with both front and back sprites, all these attack animations, and all of these various overworld and people sprites, and then there's also this huge list of items that's in the game. It is absolutely astonishing what all they got crammed into these first Pokémon games. Now, if you're at all familiar with what games on the Game Boy were like at the time, they were very primitive, to say the least. And the Pokémon games are so far above and beyond other games on the Game Boy, it's honestly crazy to think about how far ahead of their time that these early Pokémon games were, compared to how backwards and behind the times that these new ones are by today's standards. And then we've also got trading and battling through Link Cable, being able to link two Game Boys together was a really novel thing, and not enough games utilized it. Now, Pokémon wasn't intended to be a competitive game, but it became so popular and just naturally fit in as one. And then there's also so much mystery and lore surrounding the Pokémon games. Of all playground rumors in video games, Pokémon had the most of it. Some of the most popular ones were like, finding Mew under that truck, or catching any number of Pokémon that weren't actually in the game, 
or lore bits like Gengar is actually the ghost of a Clefable, or how Ditto is actually a failed Mew clone. Or maybe you're the one that killed Gary's Raticate, and that's why he's at the Pokemon Tower, to mourn it. And there were also all these glitches that made it feel like truly anything were possible in this game. And so Pokemon stands as the final monument in the seven wonders of video game history.